Kurt. Kurt, that was great. Anyone who would question how brilliant Kurt is and how accurate, anyone who calls it the news hour with Jim Lehrer has a, a relish for accuracy that I think even Mrs. Lehrer still calls it the McNeil Lehrer news hour, so <laughs> have no fear. Always reminds me of the guy who once said that, the way he put it was he said that PBS comes in five parts, and what he said was, he said the five parts of PBS were animals talking, English people talking, animals mating, English people mating, and the news hour with Jim Lehrer. So I could have, uh, I could have saved for a little bit of time by just saying I'm the one from category five, but if I had done that, I would not have gotten to hear that really nice introduction, which I enjoyed very much, and I'm very grateful for you doing this, Kurt. Thank you for being here. In fact, uh, Jim Lehrer first put historians on TV. It wasn't done too much, but He's the one who really got the idea in the early 70s, and he tells this story. It was one of the first things he ever did for PBS. He was just up for, from Texas, and he always thought, you know, maybe you should put an historian on to talk about the provenance of current events. So he was doing the Senate Watergate hearings. It was the spring of 73, and as he tells it, they had about a four-minute inter intermission, so he thought, why not put on a historian to talk about, you know, historical context made a great choice, the wonderful historian Barbara Tuckman, I'm sure many of you have read, but what he forgot was that he had only four minutes and she was known for writing these really long books. So uh, <laughs> what happened was, he said, uh, Mrs. Tuckman, Watergate remind you of anything in history? She said, yes, Jim, and to understand Watergate, you have to go back to the 14th century. <laughs> and she began to talk, and three minutes passed, uh, she still was on her first sentence, took a breath, he was very relieved, and then she said, and now, Jim, that brings us to the 15th century. <laughs> and he didn't put historians on regularly for about 20 more years, so I was extremely grateful to beat the statute of limitations. But I am very honored to be here today to speak in Bill Clinton's name and also at this great school. I think you all know how important it is to the country and also what a wonderful start it's gotten. I mean, to be able to accelerate to this point in such a short period of time. It's something that is known by people, particularly in this business, all over the country. And very appropriate that it be in Bill Clinton's name. Two reasons, particularly, that I can think of that mean a lot to me. One is the fact that, you know, if you have to take lessons out of a president's life, you know, you begin to think what's going to be very meaningful to later generations. And I've got two boys who are 13 and 11, and one thing that, you know, I've talked to them about Bill Clinton and his life said so one thing that's very important to remember is that this is someone who came from a family in Arkansas, had no father, didn't have money, didn't have connections, didn't have his way paved, and yet had the talent and the brains and the ambition and the sense of public service that carried him as far as it did. There's nothing more basic to the idea of America. You look at an Abraham Lincoln. You know how, many, how much education, formal education, Abraham Lincoln had. He had probably about a year and a half, I'd say. And even that is being generous because that year and a half was Lincoln going to what were called blab schools where there'd be kids who were from, you know, the age of kindergarten through the age of, you know, the 12th grade, all blabbing at the same time. Teachers who were good natured but, you know, would give misinformation of the order of everyone in Albania is an albino. You know, a lot of what he was taught was, was not really very good information. And yet, Lincoln was able to pull himself up, you know, the same way. No, no connections, no money, you know, almost everything else that you think would be against his having a brilliant career. But he had the drive, and particularly in Lincoln's case, he loved reading, and he just read his eyes out, and it was his own university. And that's how he became a great man. Harry Truman, very much the same. One of the things that just even hurts me to think about is that Harry Truman, as smart and curious as he was as a child, was not able to have a college education. His family was too poor. When he was a kid, his parents said, you know, Harry, you know, these glasses that you're wearing, he had these very thick glasses from a very early age, we can't afford to have them replaced if you break them, so you can't do sports. And so the result was that he used to say, I, I read every book in the Independence Public Library, which I always thought was an exaggeration until 
I actually went to Independence. It's not that big a library, but so he probably did. But he was able to educate himself. And in Truman's case, uh, the book that actually had the biggest impact on him was not something that was in the library. It was a book his mother bought from a traveling salesman, which was called Great, terribly politically incorrect, Great Men and Famous Women. The idea that women could not be great, only famous. Subtitle was from Nebuchadnezzar to Sarah Bernhardt. And Truman read every page of those four volumes. It had a very big influence on him. So the point I'm making is that the life that is commemorated both in this school and also in the Clinton Library is a life that could not be more American because the idea of the founders was that anyone in this country can be president. There shouldn't be barriers. The only barrier should be the limit of your willingness to educate yourself and essentially reach up and achieve that. And one problem nowadays, I think, if the founders came back, I think they would be unhappy with the fact that many Americans, particularly kids who are a little bit older than my son's age, are less eager to go into public service than perhaps they might have been in an earlier generation. They might feel that there are too many barriers or their life is too tough or it's not paid as, as well as certain uh, professions are in the private sphere. That's why a school like this is so important. And going back to what I was saying earlier, the most important thing I think is that for the Bill Clintons of the future, for the Harry Trumans and the Abraham Lincolns of the future, Lincoln and Truman didn't have the ability to attend a Bill Clinton School of Public Service. The students who are here today do have that ability, and that is thanks to the leadership of Skip Rutherford and all those who have made this possible. So if I could begin with a hand for all of them. I couldn't admire more of what you're doing, and it's making this a better world for my children to grow up in, so I'm very grateful for that. One thing that's a little bit different uh, between what historians do and what people even in the School of Public Service do, and certainly journalists do, is that we historians look at presidents usually with the hindsight of about 30 or 40 years. You know, I, I always tell my wife I have no political opinions about living people which drives her crazy, but professionally almost have to. And there is a difference. You know, one problem with doing this, this kind of thing, you know, being a presidential historian, is that there are occupational hazards, which is that if you're especially writing about one president 24 hours a day for four or five years, you know, reading letters and listening to tapes and so on, you can run a real risk of becoming a real living replica of the person that you're writing about. Be fine if you're writing about Bill Clinton, fine if you're writing about George Washington. Uh, two of my books were on Lyndon Johnson and it made my wife a little bit nervous to think that I might be just like him <laughs> by the time I was finished. Uh, and you begin to sort of learn uh, about the people that you're studying about. I mean, in Johnson's case, for instance, I was told a story not too long ago. This is a story, the kind in, in Texas they refer to as a story that has the added advantage of being true. Not all of them are. <laughs> Johnson had asked a speechwriter to do a speech for him, so the guy did, brought it in, and Johnson read the speech and said, well, this text is fine, and I like the opening quotation. The opening quotation was from Aristotle, as Aristotle said, blah, blah, blah. And Johnson said, but there's a problem with this, and the aide says, what's the problem, boss? Johnson said, the problem is, no one in this audience is going to know who the hell Aristotle was, so just keep the opening quotation, but change it to, as my daddy said. <laughs> It's a kind of thing, uh, great for him as president, it would not do wonders for me as an historian to, to do things like this. And so when you're studying a president, you begin to sort of understand and learn how he would operate in a certain situation. I, I am thrilled to know, for instance, that the Clinton, Clinton Library had such an, an enormous, uh, enormously successful first year, especially when it's very hard to get visitors to come and visit a new institution. When I learned about that this morning, I couldn't help but think, as I said, I studied Johnson for a long time. When LBJ opened his presidential library, his timing was a little bit less propitious. It was at the height of the Vietnam War, which was terribly unpopular. He was almost burned in effigy the day the library was opened. So then opens this library and museum to the glories of Lyndon Johnson.
did not get a huge number of visitors. It just seemed a little bit off message with many people at that time, especially University of Texas. A lot of people felt strongly about the Vietnam War. And it didn't make Johnson happy to know that few pe so few people were coming. So Johnson got an idea. One of his great friends was Darrell Royal, uh, University of Texas football. And so Johnson called up Royal, whom I actually saw last summer at Lady Bird Johnson's burial. And he called him up and said, you know, Darrell, I want you to have the guy who makes announcements at halftime in that stadium of yours across the street from my library make an announcement at halftime. Anybody who wants to take a leak or get some cool water can do it at the Johnson Library across the street, <laughs> which he did. And thousands of people flowed through the front doors. And by the end of that year, Johnson Library was the best attended presidential library <laughs> in the United States. You learn the way that presidents get things done, but I was so thrilled that the Clinton Library did not have to go through any contrivances like that <laughs> to be as successful as it is. But that's sort of what this life is like. Uh, for instance, I went down to the LBJ Ranch a few years ago uh, to take a look at LBJ's house, which will now be open, uh, open to the public soon now that Lady Bird has passed. But anyone been to the LBJ Ranch? You can go, well, quite a few. You can go as a tourist now and see the outside, but not the inside of the house, which will be restored soon to the way it was when Johnson was president. And Lady Bird was nice enough when I was doing this work on her husband. She said, you know, you've been to our house a lot of times, but with big groups, you know, dinners and so on, and you're too polite to look around. I think she may have uh, been a little bit misinformed mis uh, about how polite I was, but she said, why don't you come one day when I'm not there and, and just look around and have a sense of who my husband was? And for a presidential historian, if it's a house that a president has had a lot to do with building and designing, it's almost like walking through the guy's autobiography. If you go through Mount Vernon, you can learn so much about George Washington, even if you knew nothing about him before you went in, or Monticello with Thomas Jefferson, President Clinton's namesake. And so for a presidential historian to be able to go through a president's house like Johnson's, it's about as excited as it, as it gets. But when I say that to people who are not presidential historians, including my two children, I'm aware that it may not be quite as exciting as it is to us, and it reminds me of the guy who, LBJ was once talking to a famous economist who was brilliant but not too captivating, and he was going on and on, and finally Johnson said, you know, the problem with you, professor, is, and forgive the language, but I want to be historically accurate, uh, you have to always uh, apologize for much of LBJ's language if you're going to be accurate. So the problem, professor, is that when you talk on and on about e economics, it's like, Pissing down your leg seems hot to you, but not to anybody else. So, uh, so I'm afraid that when I talk about going through presidential houses, it may not be quite as hypnotizing to you as it is for me and others, but you know, very interesting for people who are in the business. So anyway, I went down to the LBJ Ranch and went through the house, and it really was. You, know, you can learn so much about a president. And I went behind the house, and behind the house was something that looked like sort of a pale blue convertible Studebaker, but there are some benefits to this research. I knew there was actually something called the Amphicar. Anyone here know what the Amphicar was? Sir, you want to tell us? Goes in the water. Goes in the water, goes on water, also goes on land, but also looks like a normal car. And from my research, I knew that LBJ used this for all sorts of reasons, but one of them was, if you were a new member of the LBJ White House staff, He'd invite you down to Texas to the ranch and say, let's go for a drive in my car. You, you'd hardly say no. So you'd get in, and Johnson would start to drive this thing extremely fast, would throw his Stetson across the speedometer so you wouldn't see how fast you were really going. And at least in his early years as president, he would have a paper cup that was at the beginning of the ride filled with Cuddy Sark and very soon was empty. And this was the imperial presidency. A president could not do this nowadays. The way he'd have the cup refilled would be he would just jam on the brakes and hold out the empty cup. And apparently his Secret Service detail had to hustle so fast to refill this thing that if they were slow, he'd have them sent to Nome, Alaska or someplace they didn't want to be. Then you'd be going very fast once again in the Amphicar. And you might find yourself going straight toward Lake Lyndon B. Johnson. Anyone want to guess who named Lake Lyndon B. Johnson? You may be able to guess. 
So it would be going straight toward the lake, at which point Johnson would say, brakes, you're failing, we're all going to die. So the car would go into the lake and begin to sink. And you may think this is sort of frivolous and odd for a president to be doing, but he had a serious purpose, and the serious purpose was to find out when the crunch comes, does the aide try to save his president, or does he try to save himself? Now, the problem was that many of the presidential aides of that time didn't have the benefit of going to the Bill Clinton School of Public Service because, by my count, most of them tried to save themselves. So you have this scene of the aides just you know, swimming away, presumably letting the president drown, at which point Johnson would shoot the guy a disgusted look and press the button and the gills would inflate, and once again you were in the amphicar on the lake, so that later on back in Washington, Johnson would say, there's old Joe or old Jack, pretends he's loyal to me, but when the crunch came, guess who's blank he was trying to save. <laughs> so that's what this business is like. You know, you begin to absorb the way they talk and the way they operate, and even sometimes what the successes and failures of, the, of their leadership was. But the thing that you really have to wait for if you're writing presidential history is you do have to wait some decades because only then are you going to get access to, for instance, many of the treasures that are in the Clinton Library, letters and national security documents. These take a while to come open in every presidential library. And the other thing is that you need hindsight. I mean, in terms of information, you know, it takes a while to really see a president whole. I always think, I come from Illinois, so a big deal in Illinois is Adlai Stevenson, who ran for president twice. And when I was a young historian, I met a guy who had worked for Stevenson, and I said, you know, you must have learned so much about politics at the elbow of the master. And he said, well, Stevenson was clueless as a campaigner, but we couldn't be so impolite as to say that during his lifetime. And he told me the story of they were campaigning, I think, in northern Florida, and Stevenson knew he wasn't connecting with the voters. He said, what am I doing wrong? And one of the aides courageously stepped forward to give the boss the bad news. He said, well, Governor, you remember this morning in that shopping center, that little girl handed you that stuffed dead baby alligator? Stevenson said, yes. And the aide said, well, what you should have told her was, that'll look perfect in my living room back in Illinois, instead of what you did say, Governor, which was, for Christ's sake, what's this? <laughs> gives a little bit of texture that you didn't get at the time. Uh, not long ago, President Bush was meeting with Tony Blair, and you read the newspapers, and you, know, you saw on TV these commentators. It was almost as if you know, they were in the room listening. Skip, I'm sure, has had this experience a thousand times. We haven't talked about it, where he has actually been in a meeting with the president and a foreign leader, and then he will read the newspaper the next day with a so-called inside account probably has no connection to what was really said. Oftentimes, you really do have to wait until someone like Skip's notes are opened or when you can talk as an historian to Skip when he feels free to say everything that was said between the president and the foreign leader, you have to wait a while. And when President Bush was meeting with Tony Blair, I couldn't help but remember, there was a meeting between President Kennedy and Harold Macmillan when he was pre uh, British Prime Minister. And you read the New York Times the next day, so they discussed the Soviet Union and so forth, which they did. And I was writing about Kennedy years ago. I got a hold of the notes that were taken by someone who was in on the meeting, you know, one of these high officials like Skip, his maybe predecessor in public life years ago. And I read the account, and I noticed that this guy's handwriting was not as good as Skip's to begin with but it was a very exact account of this conversation. And I looked at it, and you know, the most important thing the two guys seemed to discuss was not the Soviet Union, but Kennedy was complaining about bad press coverage of Jackie. You know, and he was ranting and raving, this is so terrible, it's really annoying me. And Macmillan was older and wiser, said, Jack, brush it off, it's just the press. And Kennedy said that, you know, that's easy for you to say, it's not you, Harold. You know, how would you like it if the press wrote that your wife Lady Dorothy was a drunk, which actually she was. <laughs> and Macmillan said, if they wrote that my wife was a drunk, I would just issue a statement saying, you should have seen her mother. <laughs> it's a kind of thing that if a historian waits, you can begin to sort of get under the surface and really understand what these people were like. But the more important thing is hindsight. You know, I was talking about Harry Truman earlier. Harry Truman is uh, one of Bill Clinton's heroes uh, during the 1992 campaign when all sorts of people suddenly decided they liked Harry Truman. Bill Clinton said, I come a, a, from a family that actually liked Truman while he was still alive. <laughs> Not everyone else did. 
But in Truman's case, Truman went back as an ex-president to Missouri in 1953, quite unpopular. Anyone know what his poll rating was? Or want to take a guess? Uh, 23, excellent. Uh, and you, I assume, are not even an alumnus of the Bill Clinton School of Public Service, so you're, you're doing 22 or 23, Gallup poll. And so I was curious when I first encountered that number, you know, what was this? Well, unpopular war, there was some petty corruption in Truman's entourage. A lot of people mentioned Truman's language. They said he didn't talk enough like a president. Truman was once asked famously what, by a reporter what he thought of Richard Nixon. His reply was, I think Nixon is full of manure. And some of his aides went to Mrs. Truman and said, can't you get the boss to use more presidential language? And her reply was, you have no idea how long it took for me to get him to use the word manure. So <laughs> that's what she was dealing with. But that's what hindsight really brings you, because if you wait 30 years, you know, what is important to historians now 57, or how many years, 54 years after Harry Truman became an ex-president is not the things that were obsessive to people at the time. They were ultimately that Harry Truman was a guy who devised a strategy in the late 40s and the early 50s to win the Cold War that allowed a lot of Cold War presidents to prevail. Finally, with hindsight, we know that the Cold War ended and America won, so we give due respect to Harry Truman, who was the guy who devised the strategy. And so the lesson from all that is that presidents look very different 30 years later from the way that they did at the time. It takes time to siphon away what is not important and get historians and a larger group of Americans to understand what really was important and why we should be grateful to a former president. I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the things I write about in this book that I published about, I guess, six months ago called Presidential Courage. And the idea of the book is that I wanted to write a book that covered 200 years of American history. It's a short book, I hasten to mention, uh, that showed one thing. And that is, you know, these two boys of mine who were 13 and 11, they grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, as I say, I come from Illinois, I take them back home as often as I can, so they're not creatures of Washington, I hope. But, you know, we all live in a political culture there that is dominated by pollsters and consultants and people who, you know, feel very smart about politics, in which, you know, in certain ways, the best thing a, a leader can do is to stay popular and to raise money and not do things that will jeopardize his or her career. And so the whole point of the book is to show that oftentimes that's fine, but at extraordinary moments in American history, we have really depended on presidents who would do the right thing, even if it meant losing their popularity or their reelection, or in some cases, their lives. And that all came from, as I write about it, and in my mind, George Washington. And I opened the book with the scene of George Washington and Mount Vernon and the rain is coming down, terrible thunderstorms, and he is upset, and he's anxious, and he's tormented, and he's going through the worst political crisis of his life. People are irate again at him, and the reason is something that he brought on himself. He was almost to the end of his presidency. He had become convinced that the British were gonna invade the United States, and this time they'd win. So the U.S. would be a nice little experiment that lasted for about 15 years until the British stamped it out. He knew we didn't have the military to resist it, so he sent John Jay to London to do a treaty with the British. Jay brought it back. Washington approved it, sent it to the Senate. He knew that in doing so, all hell would break loose, and it did. Uh, people wrote Washington letters saying, you should be assassinated, you should be impeached. What are you, some kind of British agent? You know, we thought we defeated the British just a decade ago. Uh, he had never had this experience. He was used to everyone loving him. He had been elected twice unanimously. Uh, in Virginia, in taverns, veterans who had served under his command would raise glasses saying, we toast the speedy death of General Washington. Very hard for Washington to endure. John Jay was burned in effigy all over the place. He had a sense of humor about it. He said that he could walk the length of the United States at night merely by the light of all his burning effigies, which is probably true. <laughs> but the point is that if you looked at it through a current political lens, 
you know, a consultant, you know, a jaded consultant would say, why would Washington do such a thing? You know, he drove his numbers down, became unpopular. He was about a year from leaving the presidency. Why not just stay in the presidency as popular as he was when he came in? Why go through all this? You know, defer it to his successor. A lot of people would have done this. But the fact is that that would have been totally alien to who George Washington was. It never would have occurred to him, you know, not to do the right thing. And in doing so, he knew that he was the only person in the United States who had the stature to get Americans to accept this hated treaty. But more than that, Washington was, I think, inventing what I call presidential courage. He knew that as president, everything he did was gonna set a precedent for every one of his successors. So what he was trying to send a message was saying to his successors, you, like me, may be at a moment where you have to sacrifice your popularity like me, but do it because it's essential in this system. And in Washington's case, he died two years after his presidency. Martha Washington felt that his premature death was owed largely to his heartbreak over Americans turning their backs on him over Jay's treaty, but Washington felt that it was well worth it. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, 1864, is another story I tell. In the summer of 1864, Lincoln was told by his version of political consultants, you're gonna lose re-election this fall against General McClellan. And the reason is, Northern voters are frustrated with the Civil War going so slowly, but they'd be willing to put up with that, but you issued this Emancipation Proclamation. You're saying the Civil War will not be over until the slaves are freed. Northern voters were willing to do this to bring the South back, but not to free the slaves, so they're gonna vote against you unless you cancel this emancipation. And so, given this news, you know, Lincoln decided, and had to decide, what am I gonna do? And as I said, I grew up in Illinois, uh, a very big Lincoln devotee, as most of us. Anyone here actually from Illinois? All right, well. Land of Lincoln. Uh, what age were you when you were taken to the Lincoln sites in Springfield? Three or four. She was three or four and been there 40 times since. That's a real Illinoisan. Uh, I, I had to wait till I was eight years old, but I was taken, my one big memory, I was taken to the Lincoln house and the guide was taking my little brother and me around and I wish I could say I thought to ask, you know, what was Lincoln's position on civil liberties or something, but I asked the guide, you know, when Lincoln's boys were naughty, did he spank them? It's a lot more interesting to me at that age. And the guide said with great disgust, no, Lincoln didn't believe in discipline. He just let those brats run wild through this house. And I heard that Lincoln was the man for me. So I began <laughs> reading about Lincoln and other presidents. It had a lot to do with my getting into this line of work. So for me to think that Abraham Lincoln would even conceive of canceling the emancipation, I, I would not have been able to imagine that at an early age, but the fact is he did. He wanted to be reelected. He thought McClellan would be a disaster, which he was right about, but he quickly realized, essentially, I can't do something that cheap and still be Abraham Lincoln. He felt even then that he would go down in history, as he put it, as the liberator of a race, and that was more important than reelection. And as it happened, of course, he was reelected, but in the end, he had to pay for his presidential courage with his life, because why did John Wilkes Booth murder Lincoln? It was because he hated the idea that after the war, the slaves would be freed and that African Americans would be on the road to equality. Uh, Harry Truman is another story I write about in the spring of 1948. With Truman, like President Clinton, Truman is one of my heroes. Truman, you could write about six things. You could write about you know, the firing of General MacArthur during the Korean War when MacArthur came back, and there was a big thought that MacArthur would run against Truman in 1952 as a Republican candidate, and he would have been a very dangerous opponent. You know, He gave this big speech to Congress. Democrats were very nervous. It was said that when MacArthur gave this emotional speech to Congress, on the Republican side of the House, there was not a dry eye on the Democratic side of the House, there was not a dry seat. They were very worried about <laughs> what was gonna happen. But what I wrote about instead was Truman and the recognition of Israel in the spring of 48, because it shows a lot of the cross pressures on a president. Truman's case, uh, Secretary of State George Marshall was threatening to resign if he did it and blast him. Truman was saying, I can't afford to lose General Marshall. 
Truman's wife, Bess, who was a fine woman in many ways, she did not allow Jewish people in her house in independence, either before the presidency or afterwards. So she was on the other side. Truman, as it happened, had a business partner in the 20s who was an old army friend named Eddie Jacobson, who was Jewish, and he shows up in the Oval Office at a crucial moment with tears streaming down his face saying, Harry, I've never asked you for a favor, but my people may face another Hitler. Please do something to help them. Had a big influence on him. But what I felt really decided in Truman's case, and again, you have to consider me as the source, but made a big difference that he had a sense of history. Just as Lincoln wanted to go down as the liberator of a race, Truman realized that recognizing a Jewish state might be one of the things that he would be remembered for. for. And he went back to that badly titled book, Great Men and Famous Women. And what he remembered was reading a chapter on Cyrus the Great. And he was actually a big reader of biblical history, although he didn't talk about it very much. He felt that political leaders should not talk too much about their prayer. He used to quote his grandfather, who used to say, if you hear a politician praying too loud, go home and lock your smokehouse. <laughs> but Truman read a lot of the Bible. His favorite psalm was, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. And he remembered Cyrus the Great, who had brought the Jewish people to Zion 2,000 years earlier. He thought that that might be the way he'd be remembered too. And so after it was all done, after he was president, Truman was giving a speech in New York, and he was introduced by this old friend, Eddie Jacobson, who said, you know, here's President Truman who helped to create the state of Israel, and Truman almost shoved him aside and said, what do you mean helped to create? I am Cyrus the Great, he said. I am Cyrus the Great. It meant that much to him in his retirement. Anyway, I'm not gonna run through all the presents I'm writing about because we'd be here till midnight. But uh, one more I thought I would talk about, and that is I write about John Kennedy. And in the book, I have a picture of Jackie Robinson, who is uh, my younger boy's hero, whose name is Cyrus, by the way. And the picture is of Jackie Robinson in the 1960 campaigning, campaigning for the presidential cam candidate that Robinson supported, who was Richard Nixon. And so it's sort of, you know, what is the meaning of this picture? And the meaning is this. As I write, when John Kennedy began running for the presidency in the late 50s, he thought the way to get the nomination would be to begin by getting the votes, the delegates from the white anti-civil rights South. He went to segregationist governors like John Patterson in Alabama. Uh, who defeated George Wallace in 1958 because Wallace was not enough against civil rights, got his endorsement, met with him at his house, Kennedy's house in Washington, and hoped he could do this quietly, but word got out. And so Kennedy ran into Jackie Robinson at a banquet in New York about 1958, said, Jackie, let's have a picture taken together. Robinson turned his back and walked away. He didn't like the game that Kennedy was playing at that point. And then by 1960, Kennedy turned around and realized that he could be nominated with other votes and that when he ran in the fall, it was the moral thing to do to promise that if he were elected, civil rights would come. So he said that fall, elect me president and when I am, I will end discrimination in this country by a stroke of the pen. And the problem was by the spring of 61, a lot of African Americans and others were sending Kennedy pens in the mail saying, why aren't you acting? Because he was really dragging his feet. And the reason was election returns. I mean, Kennedy had this famous narrow margin over Richard Nixon in the popular vote, which I come from Chicago, many of my friends up there take credit for. Uh, <laughs> but in the electoral vote, it was pretty close too. And the way that Kennedy won was with the votes of about half a dozen southern states and those were not African Americans or pro-civil rights voters. Those were mainly people who wanted to maintain segregation and hope that Kennedy, if elected, would stand up to it. The state of the 50 states in 1960 that went to Kennedy by the largest margin, anyone want to take a guess or perhaps you know? Georgia, 67% uh, for Kennedy over Nixon. And those were not civil rights voters, and Kennedy knew it. So 1961 passes, 1962 passes. Kennedy does a minimum on civil rights. 
hoped he could delay the problem until his second term after he was safely reelected, re said, I'll get a landslide reelection, then I'll let her rip in 1965. Problem is that events intervened, as they always do for presidents who feel that they can micromanage when to take on a difficult issue. We were talking about this before uh, we came into the room uh, at noontime today. President Clinton in 1993, I think one thing that historians will admire very much among many others is that in 1993, there were many people who were advising him, you know, don't take on the deficit, don't do anything that involves raising taxes, you're just newly in office, gonna make you very unpopular, you know, delay it maybe into your second term. That's when presidents like to do things that are tough and make them un unpopular after they get reelected. And he essentially said, no, the problem is important now. If I let it fester for four, for four more years, maybe even more insurmountable, he did the right thing. He took enormous political flack for it, but I think historians will give him enormous credit for doing so. So in Kennedy's case, Kennedy thought that he could just sort of wait and wait until 1965. But by the spring of 1963, few of you will remember and others have studied it, by the time of Birmingham, there were riots in Birmingham. Martin Luther King was putting pressure on Kennedy. You know, if you will not act, I will make you act by creating a crisis. So by the spring of 63, Kennedy's brother Bobby, the Attorney General, went to him and said, Jack, we can't wait anymore. We can't wait to 65 and to, because if we do, Americans, both, both white and black, will say, why isn't the president doing something to bring the civil rights revolution out of the streets and into the courts? So Kennedy sent this civil rights bill to Congress, made people furious. You know, I try to tell my kids what I'm writing about. They said, why did this bill make people so angry? What, what did it say? And I said, well, the bill said that you could use a hotel or a restaurant whether, whether you were white or black. And my kids say, well, why were people angry about something like that? You know, thank God they're living in a different country, but we all have to work doubly hard to make sure that people understand how terrible it was. And by sending that bill to Congress, Kennedy's poll ratings dropped about 25 points overnight, lost the White South for the most part, knew that there was a very good chance he'd lose it in 1964, and that's one reason why in November of 1963 he made that fatal trip to Texas, because he said, I'm gonna lose all these southern states, I have to have Texas. But when he was discussing this in private, and many of his aides were saying, you know, as a result of the civil rights bill, and many of the aides to Kennedy said he shouldn't do it. His congressional lobbyist, Larry O'Brien, said, you're crazy, you're just gonna cause problems for yourself. Kennedy said, it's necessary, and if I have to go down for civil rights, you know, I'll be satisfied. That's something that's worth my sacrificing my political career. So the point I'm making throughout this book, and it's a point that is made every hour in this school and in the library next door is, we have to be able to count on a president who at a crucial moment will do the right thing, even if it means maybe losing a reelection or losing popularity or even losing one's life as Lincoln did. And if you dial back through American history, if you don't have that, you don't get civil rights and we don't win World War II and we don't have the Civil War end as it did all the way back to George Washington. And what I say at the end of the book is that in the future, if God forbid we ever have a president who does not understand that presidential courage is really a job requirement, take that leader to Mount Vernon, you know, and maybe show him or her that room where George Washington was, you remember, in 1795, so upset over Jay's treaty with the rain falling down, or better yet, go upstairs and see the bed in which George Washington died in 1799. Because there he was, looking into the face of his kindly and very worried doctor, and just about the last three words that George Washington spoke on earth, he was talking about his condition, but I'd like to think it was a message to later Americans and the presidents of the future. And the three words he spoke were, don't be afraid.